Welcome everyone to our webinar introducing eLife Continuum. Uh, my name is Cora Codget uh, and uh, I'm a marketing manager at eLife. It's my pleasure today to host the webinar with uh, Ian Mulvaney, uh, eLife Head of Technology, Juliana Maciocci, uh, eLife Head of Product, and uh, Sean Roderick, eLife Web uh, Product Manager. Uh, today, Ian uh, will introduce uh, key features of the eLife uh, Continuum platform uh, and uh, demonstrate how the system works. We'll talk briefly about uh, the future use and development of the software and uh, we reserved over 20 minutes for question and answer session at the end. Uh, please uh, type your questions in the questions panel uh, at any time during the webinar. Uh, but note uh, that uh, our speakers will try to answer all questions in the time provided at the end of, uh, of the event today. So over to Ian. All right. Um, uh, is my screen showing now? Do I... There we go. All right, hello everybody. Um, let me just get set up here. There we go. All right, so I'm going to talk through this rough structure. Uh, I've changed it a little bit since uh, this morning, but we'll talk about you know, what we did, uh, why, some of the key features of the platform, some of its limitations. Um, we'll probably go into a demo at that point, uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, some of the architectural dependencies and structure. Um, I'll finish up by uh, indicating how you might be able to in install and deploy it yourselves, uh, and then we'll go go to questions. So when we when we think about publishing infrastructure for STEM, there are three core components really that most publishers have: There's the submission component, the content processing component, and then the production and hosting part. And what we've done at Continuum is. Uh, we just created that production and hosting component. Um, so we haven't, this, this system does not do submission or review, um, but nonetheless, the production and hosting component, it does, if you get that piece working for you, it does give you significant control over your own content, and it was an area that we, we made a decision to build our own platform on uh, sometime towards the end of last year. So this is a very, very high level overview. Uh, we get in a packet of XML, uh, 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 and data from our content processor, including the PDF, the typeset PDF, images. And then it goes into Continuum, where a number of processes happen. There's a publishing dashboard that our production team have access to. And finally, the content is published onto the website. And all of those three core pieces, the, the processing workflows, that publishing dashboard, and the hosting site, those are all contained inside of the eLife Continuum release. Um, so it's possible that there may be pieces of this system that are more or less interesting to different people. And we, we hope that people will find some value across the, the different components, as well as potentially the whole system as well. So we were motivated uh, because at some point, um, you know, we want to we really push the limits on how content is presented and how science is communicated. And we felt at one point that we really needed to have complete end-to-end -end control of the uh, articles that we're publishing. And getting control of this production and, and hosting platform is a real key part of that. Uh, also having control of the code here in, in our own time zone, we could work very tightly with the production department and have support for the system in the same time zone that we're operating in. Um, and as we, as we started on that process, what we've noticed as well is that there are a number of other people out there who are trying to create pieces of what you might call an open scholarly infrastructure. And we felt that it's quite nice if we make the decision to open source what we've done. So we primarily built the system for those two first points, but we've made the decision to open source Continuum because we want to be able to contribute as a good player in this movement to try and create an open scholarly infrastructure. You know, and it may be that what we've built helps form a long-lasting piece of that. It may not, but by actually getting involved and, and choosing to open source this, we feel we can at least have 
a reasonable part in the conversation that happens around where all of this goes. So we're excited. Um, there, are, there are not that many pieces of open infrastructure for publishing out there. There are a couple, uh, a couple of well-known, long-standing pieces, but there are not many that have been built in the last couple of years that adopt what I'd say might be best practice for modern application development. So we're excited that this hopefully can help to contribute to that. Uh, the way we've architected it means it's possible for us to run and configure multiple versions, so it's quite easy for us to spin up test instances, uh, production instances, dev instances, uh, and that's actually really, really delightful. Um, we've built it in a modular way, so I, I hope to be able to convince you today that it's almost trivial to extend the pipelines and workflows that are in uh, eLife Continuum. I might be overselling that a little bit, but I will show you how we can do that. Uh, and we have this really nice publishing dashboard, which our production team like. We've worked hand in hand with them on the design of that. And that dashboard actually is a kind of generic container for state information about what's happening in our production system. So it can be extended quite easily. Uh, uh, all right. So a couple of the key features of this system. Uh, the system does allow good previews of articles before publishing. Um, it allows versioning of article content and versioning of scholarly content. Uh, and we worked very closely with Google Scholar to make sure that the way we structure the versions of the URIs of the published content is something that Google Scholar can um, uh, uh, make note of uh, so that we get good indexing on those versions as well. Um, uh, one of the key requirements from our production department was please make sure that we can publish an article at a set time in the future because they didn't want to have to get up at three in the morning if a particular article needed to be published at a specific time. So we've got to the minute scheduling in the system. Uh, I've already mentioned that it's quite modular uh, and it works out of the box with JATS XML. Um, there are some limitations. Uh, we did not create the ability to support issues with this system because we just simply didn't need it. Uh, we publish one issue per year, so our system just publishes continuously into that kind of issue. Uh, obviously, we have only one journal here at eLife, so the system, again, was built to support only one journal. Um, but we feel that if you really wanted to extend it, uh, you could add a couple of metadata fields that would allow you to do multi-journal publishing, but the system, system does not support that. Uh, the production system uh, does not support user accounts, so there's just one God-level account in the system that can do everything. Um, uh, it's a feature that we've discussed, but we've decided to open source the platform as is today, rather than waiting for every possible feature that could be built into it. And installation at the moment is a little quirky. It's something we're working on to make it a much easier path to get up and running for other people probably in the next week or two, but it's something I'd highlight now as, as a small limitation. All right, I'm going to now walk you through most of the dynamics of what happens in the system. So we start with an Amazon bucket, uh, and the Amazon bucket is, is where our content processors send us uh, the data. There's a, a, a thin FTP facade, so for them they just FTP the content in, there's no change to their workflows or patterns. Or, uh, and as soon as an item lands in our bucket, we have those, this Amazon bucket configured to trigger a message into a queue, that message starts a workflow. And that workflow is quite configurable. So the first workflow, the main job of this workflow is to prepare this article for publication. And one of the things it will do is it will check to see if this article has been published already, whether there is a version number. Uh, and if there is, it will prepare the article with the next available version number. The way it does that is it checks via API against a metadata store that we've built. And that met metadata store is the place that holds all of this article versioning number. Uh, information, as well as other metadata about the article. And once the workflow is happy that it's done everything it needs to, it can trigger another workflow, again via a message queue. And that workflow uh, is the workflow that will communicate via API with our hosting system. And we're using Drupal for our hosting. And this create Drupal page workflow is going to push a packet of data over to Drupal, which is going to prepare the skeleton of the article in an unpublished state ready for preview by the production team. Uh, the production team have their publishing dashboard, and they can, from the publishing dashboard, preview the content on the Drupal site. And once they're happy that the article meets their requirements, using another queue, they trigger another workflow 
which is the workflow that's actually going to communicate with Drupal to set the, the content to a published state. Um, once it's been published, we now know that that article version that we had reserved way back at the top of the process has now been used. So it will update the metadata store to say, yep, we've, we've used that version number. So if you see another article coming in, this version number has already been published. Please increment the version number for a new version of this article. So how does the dashboard know about what's going on? And how does the dashboard get state information about the article as it's happening? Uh, inside of each of these workflows that I've described, every single individual activity can emit uh, information about what they have done, what the status of their activity is, and we push those events and pieces of information into an event store uh, via these queues. And the dashboard is just reading directly out of that event store. And so the system is quite nicely decoupled. Uh, we could reconfigure it to introduce new workflows. We can extend the workflows to uh, introduce new activities. And uh, events could, in principle, be pushed into that event store from even further upstream in the process or further downstream in the process, if we so wished. So that's kind of the high-level schematic of how the system operates. Um, uh, what I have here is just a description of the actual software components that we've built. So each of the square boxes represents a different code repository that we're making open source today. Um, the documentation that we're making available gives a better description of what each of these does. I'm not going to go into that in detail right now. Um, what I will do, though, is I'm going to flip over to some of the code to show you how some of these pieces at a high level that I've described are actually configured in code. So hopefully this will, hopefully this will work. All right, so let's pick uh, workflow. So much of this code is written in Python uh, using um, an Amazon Web Services system called Simple Workflow. Um, I'm going to just pick the workflow uh, published, per pu uh, published perfect article workflow. And these workflow definitions are really just kind of metadata containers that point to a specific activity. Um, they give some timeout information to uh, Amazon Simple Workflow. And you, the way you compose activities into a workflow is just through one of these description files. So if you had another activity that you wanted to inject into a workflow, it would be as simple as extending this workflow description to include a descriptor of that activity that would, would take place. So, uh, And if you have a different type of workflow, you can just create a new workflow mechanism and register that with simple workflow. Um, this is an example of, of an activity file, uh, which uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the activities, activities themselves, uh, we've created them all inside of the eLifeBot repository, but an activity doesn't, in principle, need to be contained inside of this repository. As long as that activity is communicating with simple workflow, it could happen with your content processor. It could happen in the marketing team. As long as the information is being mediated between the result of that activity and the Amazon simple workflow process, it can be part of one of these workflows. Um, I talked about how one workflow or one activity in a workflow can trigger another workflow. I'm going to just very briefly describe how that happens. So uh, the way this works is, is we construct a message uh, with the name of a workflow that we want to, to trigger. Um, that message is then pushed onto a queue. And uh, the queue is called a workflow starter queue. And as long as the workflow starter queue receives a message in the right format with the name of an appropriate workflow, there's a little service that is listening on that queue, and it will go and trigger the new workflow. So any activity that you imagine, using just a few lines of code, can spin up and run another activity once it's been successful. Uh, and all of this workflow-to-workflow -workflow communication is mediated through an SQS queue, so the communication is fairly robust. Um, I talked about how any given activity can send an event into the event data store uh, so that 
those events can be displayed to the production team on the dashboard. I'll just show you quickly how, how that happens. So uh, we have a thing called an event monitor, uh, an emit monitor event. And here we just have a small little message. And again, this sends that message into another named queue. We have a process listening on that queue, which just consumes those messages, uh, which it associates with the appropriate article ID. And those are stored in the event data store, ready to be um, exposed to, to the production team when they're looking at the status of their articles. So that's kind of a quick overview of, of some of the code structure. And we found it quite flexible to work with them. And we're pretty happy with, with that code structure. All right, demo time. Um, this is where we're going to try and do a quote unquote live demo. So everyone cross your fingers for me here. Uh, it, it should work. Um, so uh, what we have is, um, what I'm showing you here is a, uh, a test version of the eLife website, which I'm logged into as, as an administrator. This screen here is the publishing dashboard, again, a test version of the publishing dashboard. What I have here is on the right hand side, I have an interface to an Amazon bucket, which is configured for this test workflow. And on the left hand side, I have some local files. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one of these local files. I'm going to start with uh, these two, 14321 and 16616. I'm going to push them into this test bucket. That test bucket is going to trigger an event, which will start the, the bot processes. And they will start to emit messages, which will be visible on the dashboard. What we'll then see is we'll see that from the dashboard user, I can preview that article. But as a logged out user, I won't be able to preview the article. We'll then attempt to publish those articles into the test system, and we'll be very happy. So let's go. Let's uh, try and publish these articles. Here we go. We drag them across. Um, this is the bit of the demo that's dependent on upload speeds to Amazon. Getting there. OK, they've uploaded. So we're going to go back to our dashboard. And when I refresh, we should hopefully see that there are more articles in progress now. There, we've got four articles in progress. This is good. The demo seems to be working. So let's go to our in progress section. And we have one of the articles, 16616, which is one of the articles that I just pushed. When we dig into this article, each of the activities in the perfect publish article workflow is emitting events into the event store. And those events are now being represented in this dashboard. So we can see the article came in, it got unzipped. Uh, it checked for a version number. Uh, it scheduled delivery of the metadata to Crossref. Uh, it took the JATS XML and extracted some key metadata from that XML. Uh, it decided whether or not this article should be published instantly or not published instantly. Uh, so when we initially built the system, we talked with our production team. And they said, you know, we'd love to at some point be able to publish in a completely hands-off way where we don't do any previewing of the article content. Um, so we have a flag where you can set that for types of articles. Uh, as it happens, we haven't yet moved into a, a regime where we're doing automatic publication. We're still checking and doing proofing on every single item. But if you want to, Continuum does support that. Uh, there's a really nice mechanism inside of Continuum which takes the image files uh, and prepares them for a variety of formats for, for publishing on the web. Uh, we add content into a CDN. That's what the deposit assets does. Uh, we prepare the communication with Drupal. Um, content is pushed into Drupal. Uh, LAX gets updated. And we schedule delivery of the content downstream. OK, so we should now be able to preview this article. I have no idea what this article is. I just picked it at random from eLife's corpus. 
So this is uh, uh, a, a, a publish on accept manuscript and accepted manuscript. But the key thing here is if I look at this in a browser that I am not logged into the site on, oh, it is already published. OK. Uh, so we have successfully published that article. Um, and let's just go back and see if we can find the other article that we pushed through, which was number 14321, which we have not found yet. Let me refresh. hasn't come through yet. Um, so some of the other features in the dashboard, uh, we mentioned about scheduling. Uh, we're able to take the article content and ske schedule to, to within a minute uh, a particular time for, for publication. Um, I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, and it's also possible to batch publish a number of articles at the same time if you're so interested. Um, all right, I'm going to flip back to the presentation now. Right. Um, so we do make a, a lot of use of Amazon Web Services. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the level of coupling that we have for those different services. So that if you were thinking about implementing this system and you were trying to decide how many of these dependencies would be blockers for you? You could try and have a, have a bit of a think about that. So the key, the key service that we use is Amazon Simple Workflow that mediates all of the process-to-process -process communication. And that is very tightly linked to the architecture of the system. I think it would be quite difficult to use the system without using Amazon Simple Workflow. But the good news is it's an extremely cheap service to use. So we, we had a uh, billing of about $1,500 last month. $3 was the cost of uh, our use of Simple Workflow. So it's a really, really small cost. Um, we're using Simple Queuing Service and uh, S3 and Bucket Notifications. Those uh, are core pieces of how the system communicates. But they are just being used as vanilla queues that contain JSON messages. If you really wanted to, you could abstract that layer and put in a different queuing system like RabbitMQ. For the bucket notifications, you could just use some kind of cron job uh, on a location where your content was being delivered to. And in the first version of the system, when we launched it in February, we used a cron job like that. Uh, there is some use of Amazon Simple Mail Service uh, and CloudFormation templates to help with um, systems notification and building the system. Uh, those are nice to have, but not need, you don't need them for the core running of the system. And then finally, we make a lot of use of Amazon EC2 for running the actual activities, but it's in, entirely irrelevant where those activities run. Uh, our build processes can also build into local vagrant instances. So even though we use EC2, which is probably the highest cost in Amazon that we incur at the moment, um, I don't think that there's any necessity to actually run any of this in EC2 if you if you didn't want to. Okay. Okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we we deployed the system inside of eLife. Um, we've created uh, another project called Builder, uh, and uh, Builder is currently being used to deploy all of eLife's systems, not only Continuum but a number of other internal systems as well, um, and Builder is an example of infrastructure as code. It's built on top of uh, a system called SaltStack. And we use Builder. We use a command called Builder Deploy. And what Builder Deploy does is it will check to see if there is a thing called a cloud formation template already generated in Amazon. And the cloud formation template describes the, um, the geometry of how uh, a machine should be built, uh, whether it has connections to databases, what the software dependencies are, uh, what kind of ports should be open on a specific machine. Um, all that's kept in version control in the builder configuration scripts. 
If a CloudFormation template doesn't exist for a project, Builder will go ahead and create one for you. And then uh, Builder looks at two kinds of configuration. There is a public configuration file, which has all of the vanilla configuration about the machine. But in order to use Builder, you also have to create a private configuration file on GitHub as a private repo, which is uh, one that only you and your system can access. And that's for storing confidential secrets like Amazon keys or uh, database passwords. Um, the Builder deploy command will combine information from these three sources and end up with EC, running EC2 instances with the software configured on it. Uh, so we've also open source Builder uh, as part of open sourcing of the Continuum project. Uh, mainly because we think uh, doing that will make it slightly easier for people to get up and running. Um, I mentioned before that configuration is a little bit idiosyncratic. Uh, we have a lot of um, configuration files across the system. So we're working on creating a couple of helper scripts to help you configure the system. Uh, the system as it's currently configured obviously uses a lot of Amazon resources. We have a create AWS resources script, which will automatically create all of the required buckets and queues and policy permissions. Um, and uh, we've nearly completed uh, another script, which acts as a master configuration hub for all of the configuration files that go into the different uh, builder repositories. Uh, this is work that's currently in progress, but we hope to have it ready and usable uh, by early next week. All right, next steps. Um, the team is continuing to improve test coverage on the system. Um, it's being integrated into a continuous integration server. Um, at the moment, we're still deploying the components on a component by component basis. So when we do a deployment, we're still deploying the website or the, the eLife bot or the dashboard. Uh, we're working on making those coordinated deployments possible so that you can just deploy the whole system in one go. Um, we're progressing in making the modularity of the entire backend and hosting infrastructure be uh, much more fine-grained, but that's work that's going to continue on through to the end of the year. And we're interested in getting, getting feedback from the community on what we've built. Uh, I mean, we think this is pretty early days. Uh, we're using it, obviously, day to day in production, it's working very well for us. Um, we don't really uh, know what are the features that would prevent Continuum from being adopted by any of you. We're interested in hearing that kind of feedback. Um, uh, so that's part of the purpose of us open sourcing this today. Uh, if you want to um, provide feedback or uh, ask for feature requests, uh, here's the repo for the existing documentation. Um, please create issues in that Git repo. Uh, that's the best way to do feature requests. And we've also just created a um, Google group for announcements and discussion about the project. Uh, it's an open group. Please join. Uh, there's nothing on that group yet, but I'll be posting some information on it in the next couple of days. Um, I personally would just like to thank the team here at eLife that I have worked with on this. They're an amazing team. Um, we've got a lot of people internally who worked on the project, and we've also worked closely with a company called Digirati to help us bring it into existence. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm just going to hand over to Giuliano, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about some of our future plans. Yeah, thanks, Ian. So, um, Continuum has provided us with uh, a new and more efficient backend, but as Ian mentioned earlier, it's also given us a lot more control and freedom over our technical infrastructure. So, to continue in that vein, we've also been working on a complete overhaul of the front end of the ELF website, and this is really a top down redesign which brings to bear what we think are the best practices in true user centered design and really centric user interfaces in ways that we think are uh, generally new to publishing uh, on the whole. So the new site that is uh, is due later this year, um, and it's it will not only provide what we think is a really great manuscript reading experience for an online journal, but it will also allow us much greater flexibility for introducing new features and experiments uh, around the content. So it will allow us to support new and interesting interactions around the content. It will facilitate 
um, new interactions uh, built within the manuscript itself. Uh, but uh, it will also really facilitate the consumption of our published research on just about any device uh, with a fully responsive design. It will work from uh, the lowest end smartphone all the way up to desktops with the best possible experience on each. So we have some very exciting things in the pipeline which we can't wait to tell you all about. Uh, and we will be uh, sending out a few updates which um, I, I recommend you should look out for in the coming months. We will be announcing uh, a few developments closer to the time. But uh, finally, before we open to discussion, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Ian for everything he's done here at eLife. Uh, many of you will by now have heard that uh, Ian's uh, starting a position with Sage this fall and uh, leading as our head of technology. So Ian, I'd say you've been a huge part of eLife's success to date. And uh, with the team we've assembled, you've really helped us. Um, uh, you're leaving us with a solid technical foundation, which will now help us to innovate as aggressively as we plan to. So you will be missed, but since we still have you for a little bit, uh, I'm going to give everyone a chance to pick your brain. Uh, and uh, as I think it's now time to take some questions. So back over to you. Thank you for that. Uh, right, thank you uh, everyone uh, who has uh, already submitted their questions. Uh, some of them have been kind enough to let us know in advance uh, what you would like to hear about in the webinar. Uh, so uh, I will start uh, reading out the questions uh, right now, but uh, feel free to still uh, keep on um, in, in, in inserting more questions in the question panel if, you, if uh, you feel that there are other concerns that you would like us to, uh, to talk about. Uh, we will start with a question from uh, Audrey uh, Hamelers, uh, who's uh, asking what technologies, uh, programming languages, does Continuum depend on? Uh, okay, so um, the uh, back-end workflow is written in Python. Uh, it uses um, a library called Boto um, and Boto Core to communicate with Amazon Web Services. Uh, some of the services, like the dashboard, uh, and the scheduling service are using some Python micro frameworks. So we have a mixture of some Flask frameworks in there and some very small Django applications. Um, uh, that was just one of the kind of idiosyncrasies of the project and built up over a over 12 month period by a variety of developers. Some people pick Flask, some people pick Django. Um, the hosting system is Drupal uh, and that was because that was where we started. Um, uh, in terms of Data stores, uh, some of those micro applications uh, are using RDS, a relational data service from Amazon, but effectively they're using MySQL or Postgres, and there's also a little bit of Redis in there for managing um, the state of some session information. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and I think uh, the next question is uh, for Sean Roderick. Uh, so uh, from uh, Pari Manoharan, uh, can this be used for print journals in volume or issues? Uh, and how about publishing books? Uh, as Ian mentioned earlier, we haven't set the system up to work with issues and volumes, uh, but it shouldn't take a great deal of effort to uh, dig into the code a bit and uh, add the functionality that you would need. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so uh, the next question uh, would be from uh, Rod uh, Cookson. Uh, I am interested in uh, the functionality of Continuum, uh, whether it will work as an MP uh, API uh, that we might add a skin to uh, so it looks consistent with the rest of our main website and timings for deployment. It looks like a very good project. Uh, yes, yeah, so the way, I mean, so I've, I've tried to describe how the, the project is composed of really sort of three core pieces, the, the workflow piece, the dashboard piece, and then the, the publishing piece on the Drupal side. Um, they all communicate uh, in a really decoupled way through these message queues. So you could certainly take any one of those components and stand it up on its own and change out one of the other components with the system that you preferred. So the way, uh, I mean, from your question, it sounds like you're pretty interested mostly in the front end and how you would customize that front end. Um, we send uh, a, a representation of the article to Drupal at the moment, uh, which is just a JSON file 
that tells Drupal about all of the core information about that article that Drupal needs to build its pages. And there's an XSLT transform that happens on the Drupal side. Um, so if you had a different hosting solution, as long as you were comfortable consuming that JSON packet to let you know that you had the article that you wanted to show, and as long as you were comfortable modifying our XSLT, uh, then you could absolutely change and, and uh, configure the, the way or the front end experience for your own site. Yeah. Right, thanks Ian. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, JR John. Uh, it would be great to learn about the functionality as it compares to other platforms. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I don't know other platforms in a great level of detail. So uh, certainly we can expose the functionality of our platform, but I'm not in. I'm not the best placed to be able to tell you this does X, whereas other platform does Y. I think in the slides where I've talked about features and limitations, I've tried to cover that at the, the highest level. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, so the next question is from Mark uh, Jacobson. Uh, how do versions that are span off uh, stay in sync with main branch development? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, we intend to uh, use um, really get releases uh, to manage uh, the core versions, but we're just getting we're just quite new to this in terms of open sourcing a project at this scale. So one of the really interesting things that happened in the last couple of weeks as we got closer to our, our open sourcing deadline is that we discovered that there were a lot more assumptions in the project than we had anticipated around how it gets deployed into the eLife's ecosystem. So one of the reasons why our deploy tools aren't where uh, where you could just pick it up and, and try it out today but you might have to wait a few days is because there were more of those assumptions than we anticipated. So what we intend to do is have the documentation and the deploy profile connected to a particular uh, set of uh, releases on the separate individual projects and coordinated across those releases. And anybody can keep up to date with the real-time bleeding edge head repos on the Git repos. But as we add significant features of functionality or make significant changes, we'll update those core releases. That's how we're in intending to manage that. Uh, there's another aspect to that question, though, which is if any of you take on the code and branch it and choose to uh, change its functionality, then what we would like um, is we'd just like to keep in communication around those efforts on the mailing list and then have you guys send us pull requests to the main uh, branches uh, and we can discuss whether it makes sense for the, the main open source version of Continuum to accept those pull requests or not. But I'll be really honest, this is quite new territory for us, so we're also open to, to hearing people's, uh, about people's experiences or views or opinions and how we can do the best possible job of managing this kind of, uh, 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 these kinds of changes. Um, great. The next question um, uh, is uh, uh, possibly a bit uh, uh, simpler from uh, Jamie uh, Priluski. Uh, does uh, each article version get a DOI? No, no, they're all contained un, uh, under one DOI. Um, we did talk about like having different DOIs for the different versions, um, but there, are, there, it's a weird thing. There's a lot of concerns around like citation um, uh, uh, dilution. Um, and I think I think it's something that the whole community is still. I don't think there's a specific answer for for what the right practice and best practice is for this. But well, we we've chosen to go for one DOI for one article, and the different article versions are just different manifestations of that article. So our key use case for this is we publish early content which has not yet been fully typeset. So when you go and see an accepted manuscript on the US website, you get the abstract and some of the metadata, but then you download the the PDF, which has not yet been fully formatted into the eLife beautiful PDF, and you don't have all that content on the web. And a few weeks later, we'll push the fully typeset version of that article up. Now, previously, the way we managed those two different versions of the article was to have them living at completely separate URIs. They still had the same DOI, now we have a system in which those two versions of the article are at versioned URIs and with the same DOI. Uh, 
So the intrinsic science and content hasn't significantly changed across those ver versions. Yeah. Um, so the next question is from uh, Julie Bay, uh, Bell uh, uh, about uh, just uh, uh, repeating or showing the GitHub URL again later. Uh, I just wanted to reassure everybody um, that uh, we will send uh, those links uh, out away to, uh, uh, to everyone who has uh, registered for the webinar, so you'll definitely uh, see them again. Yeah, you can also just sort of Google uh, uh, GitHub and Eli Sciences, and we've probably got about 100 repos up there that are public. Uh, so go have a play. Okay, excellent. Uh, Luciano Panacucci uh, asks uh, if we can uh, give an estimate on how many EC2 instances are needed and general costs of running Continuum. Sure. Uh, okay, so uh, we get we have one for the bot. Uh, we have one for the website. At the moment, uh, both the dashboard and the scheduler run on the same EC2 instance though there's a strong case to be argued that they should have separate instances because they are separate applications, but we've done them on one. Uh, um, Lax, the metadata store, has its own instance, and that's also used for the metrics. So that's it, four, currently four EC2 instances. Um, they're all running uh, like T2 small instances, so they're not really big. Um, and uh, they run continuously. Um, uh, so we have, um, uh, we're using reserved instances because we know we have a minimum number of instances that will run over a long period of time. I can't do a cost estimate off the top of my head, but for EC2 T2 small instances at a reserved instance price, and that's your cost. Right. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Gareth Meager uh, is asking uh, if uh, the slides will be available post, uh, after the meeting. Uh, yes, again, as I said, uh, um, I think uh, to some of you before uh, the webinar, we will be making the recording of this webinar available. Um, uh, if someone specifically would like to see the slides themselves, uh, we can make those available as well. So do uh, email staff at elifesciences.org and uh, we can make those available too. Um, I'll just come back to the EC2 question. Uh, what we've actually found internally is, um, so we need like four running for the live production system, but with our continuous integration server and our, uh, our test instances, we're currently running at about 40 EC2 instances. So we're looking at how we can bring that cost down. But if you just wanted to, oh, I'm, we have a lot of questions. I'm, I'm moving, I've been told to move on now, thanks. <laughs> Uh, right, uh, so um, we have another question from Jacob's uh, Fix. Uh, so um, uh, will we make the presentation available? Yes. Uh, and uh, Howard uh, Ratner is asking um, on, our, on your thoughts, Ian, on making the workflows more visual. Oh, uh, yeah, Howard. I mean, it would be really nice to do that uh, uh, so that you could get a visual kind of plug-and-play way of managing those workflows. But it, it's t totally beyond what we can do at the moment, technically. So we were, when we started this project back in February of 2015, or even before when we were looking at some of the smaller components, we looked for workflow engines, and we did assess some of the workflow engines that have those visual components. And we picked Simple Workflow and Python Boto because they were tools that were familiar to some of our developers and we could get started with easily. So. It would be a really nice to have, but it's not something that we will probably take on in the short term. Uh, great. Uh, and uh, O'Donnell is asking uh, uh, about uh, uh, whether uh, Elif Continuum is uh, compliant with um, metrics counter. Um, um, so the. <laughs> Yeah. So we, uh, the metrics uh, we are using at the moment come from Google Analytics, uh, so they're not counter-compliant, um, but there's no reason why you couldn't plug in a counter-compliant metric service. Thank you, Sean. Uh, let's, uh, um, let's get to the next question uh, from uh, Terry uh, Halbert. Uh, uh, he's asking what uh, is an EIF uh, file? Oh yeah, so um, 
Uh, that, sorry, that's a piece of internal jargon. It stands for eLife Interchange Format, but that doesn't mean anything. So what, it, what is it actually? What we do is uh, we take the JSON XML and we parse it and we take some of the data out of that JSON XML. So what we do is we take the author names, the title, the publication date, um, some min minimum information about how many references it has. And we put those into a JSON file and we send that JSON over to Drupal. Drupal consumes it, ingests it, and then uh, for each of those sort of core components Drupal needs to make inside of Drupal a node which represents that piece of metadata inside of Drupal. So the EIF is just a way of communicating between this system into, into Drupal. We could have picked a different uh, communication mechanism, like we could have picked XML, uh, we could have picked SOAP. Uh, we chose to just do this this kind of uh, JSON representation, and we've created a little Python scraper of of JATS XML, which gives a nice Pythonic interface into into JATS. Now I know I know people will say, well, why didn't you just use like XLT uh, or XQuery? And the honest answer is, when we started, we weren't familiar with those tools, so we just built something that was familiar to us. It's been working. Uh, some of the work that Giuliano referred to earlier, I think I'm very excited about on behalf of eLife. At the moment, that interchange file, it's just a representation of some of the metadata of the article. But currently, internally, we're working on a full JSON schema representation of the article that will be able to be sent to a publishing platform. But that's work that is ongoing right now, and it will take a few months before it's in a position to be previewed. So EIF is a way for our system to talk to Drupal using JSON as a representation of the article. That's the short answer. Uh, great, thank you. Um, and uh, Jacob Fix is asking, um, uh, you mentioned that it's, uh, that it's currently only working for articles, not issues, uh, just one journal. How hard would it be, uh, do you think, to extend the current application to support other uh, content types, uh, like statistical data sets or books? Uh, so it all comes down to this, actually comes down to this EIF file, which, which goes to Drupal. So Drupal is our hosting site. Drupal is where the logic of what you show to the public resides. So to extend our system to be able to represent different types of things, or to be able to represent things that live in different conceptual buckets, like an issue or like a different journal, would require just extending that communication file so that it had a placeholder for those extra pieces of metadata. So I think, I think on the processing pipeline piece and on the dashboard piece, it would be fairly straightforward, but you still have quite a bit of work to do on building your user experience and your front end to support the way you wanted to slice and dice that content. Right, the next question from uh, uh, Terry Halbert again uh, is, uh, in your demo, um, now you had an accepted manuscript. Uh, how many versions do you support, and is this a formal structure? Uh, really, uh, there's no limit on the number of versions. Um, uh, though we have this weird thing, right? So we have this thing where uh, those of us who designed the system, we were like, every single change to a manuscript, it must be possible that every single change gets its own unique version. So if there's a typo, or if we need to modify an author name or an affiliation, we'll increment the versions. But there's been an editorial policy where we only apply a version to a substantive change, and we can correct files kind of silently. Uh, so we certainly have articles that have had up to four versions on the website, but we tend not to go beyond that, most of two. There's no, there's no practical limitation to the number of versions. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any intentions to implement multiple journals publishing? We, at the moment of eLife, don't have that on our plans. Yeah. Uh, right. And the next question from uh, Nate Wright. Uh, what's actually getting passed to Drupal once the uh, AWS workflow is complete? Uh, is the XML transformed into a JSON representation before being uh, piped to Drupal, or rendered all the way down to HTML? So uh, the, uh, this, this JSON format that I talk about, it sends to Drupal information about the article, but one of the things it sends to Drupal is the location of the article XML. And inside of Drupal, there is an XSLT that takes that XML and turns it into the display HTML. 
So that process happens on the Drupal side. We don't do the conversion from XML to a full representation of the JSON, though that is something we are working on for next iteration of our publishing platform. Um, when it goes to Drupal, it goes to Drupal in an, a, an unpublished state in Drupal, and the moment you press the publishing button, what happens is it just flips a bit on the Drupal side to turn the article from being unpublished to published. So I hope that covers that question. Yeah. Right. Uh, the next question from uh, Terry Halpert. Uh, what is uh, the main use case for scheduling? Uh, so we occasionally have articles where we know that the authors or the institutions of the author uh, want to schedule the release of some information along with our publishing of the article. Now, it happens that, that mostly happens with uh, North American universities, and uh, it's very inconvenient for us to do that uh, early Pacific time because we have, uh, we're all in bed. So article scheduling's main use case is where we have a coordinated press release that we want the article to be published with. Uh, we can schedule that and not have our production team wait up Cora probably knows more about that than I do. No. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's the main use case. Yeah. <laughs> I can only confirm that. Uh, so, um, Mark Jacobson is asking uh, if uh, we can talk about uh, if and how the production and hosting workflow uh, might incorporate and leverage semantic tagging or taxonomies to improve uh, things like search filtering or building connect collections. So, um, uh, I think there's a two-part answer to that. Um, the first is, at the moment, where we host the content on Drupal, it's really kind of a, uh, uh, a quagmire of HTML and CSS and divs, and that's just a natural consequence of Drupal. It's very hard to get away from that on the Drupal side. So on the hosting side, it's pretty hard to do anything with that, although Drupal does have support for some semantic tagging modules, but it's, it's hard to get access to it on, in a programmatic way. But when we move to our new architecture, we will support um, semantic tagging on the front end. But a more interesting question is how do you extract in, in insight in, and uh, information from the article content? And I would say what you would do is you would take one of our publishing workflows in, in the bot workflow piece that I've shown you, and you would just introduce a new activity that took the content and created the appropriate semantic index and set of tags that you wanted and it would be fairly reasonably plausible to extend any one of our workflows to do that. The hard bit there is you'd have to write your logic that did that semantic tagging and analysis. Uh, Luciano uh, Panacucci asks again, to, do we have a, a XML to, uh, to HTML, and do we plan to add XML to PDF conversion? Uh, so again, the XML to HTML is happening currently on the Drupal site using an XSLT transform and it's using XSLT1. Um, we are not currently planning on going from uh, like rich HTML to PDF on the browser side at this point in time. Um, it's something we might look at next year or the year, yeah, or, or later. Uh, right now, the PDF is supplied by the content processor. And so it's a piece of the artifact that Continuum consumes and places in the CDN. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, Jacob uh, Fix has a question uh, uh, about the way it has been prepared. So can you tell us uh, how many people and how long it took to get to where we are today? So I've got my credit slide. That's a good representation of the number of heads that were actually involved at some level, though not all in full-time capacity. Uh, I certainly tended to just go to meetings and write email rather than do anything productive on the project. Uh, and we started the project in February of 2015 uh, and went live inside of eLife just after February of 2016. But there was a long period of uh, talking uh, with not that many people involved before we actually ramped up to the development. So, yeah. So it's not that headcount for that period of time. I, I'm sorry if I'm not... I, I could be more descriptive. I apologize. Uh, yeah. um, uh, Ellen Reeves is asking, as a publisher that would need to start from scratch, currently go straight from a compositor platform without much technical input to, to either, what skills would a publisher need to recruit, train, in order both to implement Continuum uh, and then to contribute uh, to its ongoing development? Um, 
I would say you want a very good systems operations person who knows how to wrangle Amazon services, and you'd want a good Python developer. Okay, we have another question about costs, which I think you have already asked, uh, answered before. Uh, Abel Packer uh, is asking: uh, Continuum can be used adapted to run. A, uh, can Continuum be used uh, adapted to run a preprint repository? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, with some work and imagination, yes, yes, uh, but. The core issue you have there is preprints tend to come in in an unstructured way, so you would still need to do some work on figuring out how to go from your submission to getting the structured data that would be used to create the, the things that go on the hosting side. Yeah. Uh, Fabio uh, Batala is asking, is the solution high uh, coupled with uh, Drupal CMS, or is it possible to subscribe any kind of integration layer to work with other CMSs? So right now, there is pretty tight coupling with Drupal uh, in terms of once I get that uh, like JSON EIF packet, at the moment our Drupal site is really the only thing in town that knows how to turn that into something that looks like a, a, a journal or a set of articles online. But the work that Giuliano referred to earlier is going to radically decouple that. Uh, so today, yes. In a few months, no. Uh, and uh, Jacob Fix is asking, did you think about integrating cross-check and cross-mark into the workflow? No. Uh, quick answer, great. So Michelle Norell uh, is asking, are there any uh, costs or is it completely free? Uh, I presume to use eLife Continuum. Uh, it's licensed under an MIT license. Um, uh, it's pr a reasonably complex piece of software, um, so uh, it's kind of like free to access the code, but you will definitely incur costs if you want to run the thing. Uh, and uh, Howard uh, Ratner uh, is asking about version information, uh, whether that should be in the metadata. Um, so. For our article versions, uh, we did think about whether that information should be encoded in the article XML, but when we get an article that gets resupplied by our typesetter, because it is difficult for them to coordinate being able to inject that into the XML, that's why we currently abstract that version information into this metadata store lax. Uh, so th that was something that we talked a lot about, and it was a kind of pragmatic decision for us to put that versioning information somewhere else rather than in the article XML. But it, it's a perfectly valid position to take, uh, and we did look at it very carefully, but uh, with the constraints we had when we built the system, we went with a different route. Uh, right, so um, I think we're now uh, on to the, our last question. I'm afraid uh, we won't be able to answer all of them uh, during the webinar, uh, but I uh, do promise that we will get back to every uh, every person that has asked the question with uh, with an answer uh, following the webinar, uh, probably via email. Uh, so the last question is from uh, uh, Fabio Batala again. Um, how does it deal with translations? Uh, the, are they also different versions, uh, and is there any linkage between uh, related documents? Um. So you, you've sneakily managed to get three questions in there, in one. I pulled all of you. Um, uh, uh, um, we hadn't thought about that. That's not a question that, the translation question isn't one that we had thought about. Um, uh, so I, I would say probably the system doesn't deal with that well. Um, definitely our, our Drupal instance is not set up for internationalization. Um, uh, so that's definitely something that, that could be improved. Um, relatedness, there are two routes to doing relatedness in the system at the moment. Uh, we have a facility in the way we tag XML in eLife to within the XML refer to related documents. So we do that where we have an article and we know that there is an associated feature article that is directly related. So that relatedness is uh, uh, something that is extracted and put into this uh, EIF JSON file that goes over to Drupal. Um, and then in Drupal, we also have another facility for within the Drupal site 
editors of the site making related connections between entities on the site. And we do that where we have podcasts uh, and podcast episodes related to specific articles. Uh, the related index at the moment lives in Drupal. Um, it's pretty hairy in terms of performance. We've got it to work, but uh, we think that it's something that could be improved. So we're working on an architecture where article relations will be exposed through a relations API. We think that will be a much more scalable way of doing it in the future. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, as I said, um, our webinar is now coming to an end. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for, uh, to Ian and Juliana and Sean for, uh, uh, for the presentations and responding to all the questions. Uh, as I said, we will go, uh, get back to those who, who we weren't able to uh, answer straight away. Uh, we hope the webinar was uh, overall useful to you. Uh, we will make the recording available uh, in the next few days. Uh, and uh, don't hesitate to continue uh, the discussion on the eLife Continuum uh, Google discussion group uh, that Ian has mentioned. Uh, and uh, send uh, any questions to uh, staff uh, at uh, elifesciences.org uh, as well. Uh, as Juliana mentioned, more innovations are brewing at eLife. Uh, so following the webinar, I would like to invite you all to sign up to our technology newsletter. Where we will be able to uh, show future developments with you that way. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, thank you for listening and uh, look out for um, the email uh, the emails uh, with the in with the invitations and the recordings from us. Thank you.